Hello, hello. It's great to be back with another episode of the OT for Life podcast. Today on the show, I have Meg Proctor from Learn, Play, Thrive. Meg is an expert in working with children with autism. She's also extremely passionate about teaching other therapists to help them expand their tool belts and to further their knowledge in helping children on the spectrum. In today's episode, we chat all about autism and play skills. Meg shares with us her wealth of knowledge on the subject, as well as provides actionable tips and strategies to help therapists teach play skills to children with autism. But before I give away the entire episode, let's bring Meg on and find out how she helps others learn, play, and thrive. If you're interested in occupational therapy, this is the place for you. This show aims to explore our profession by sharing who we are and what we do. Because for us, occupational therapy is more than just a job. Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome to OT for Life. Hey, Meg. Welcome to the show today. How are you? Hey, thank you. I'm good. I'm so happy to be here. I am so excited to bring you on because I feel like what we're going to talk about today is one of those topics that constantly is brought up. And honestly, it's one of those things that I feel like there's always a lot of questions that are hovering around the topic. And that is autism in play. And like really, even last week, there was a post in a Facebook group about somebody that was asking about this very topic. So I'm really looking forward to just jumping in and hearing what you have to say about this. But first, I wanted to start with a question. I wanted to ask you, what is one thing that you wished more people knew about autism? Oh, that's such a good question. I think when I think about OTs in particular, Or even if I think about what I wish I had known about autism before I really started getting a lot of in-depth training and a deeper understanding of autism, um, was really a broader understanding of autism. I think a lot of us kind of go, they're visual learners, or kids with autism have sensory differences. And we miss so much else that's so important in the picture of understanding how a person with autism thinks and learns. And when we miss those things, we're missing all of this information and all of these clues that could help us come up with really effective interventions. So I think if there was one thing that most of us could do to really improve our work with kids with autism, it would be learn more broadly about what the learning style of a person with autism is and how we can really teach in a way that is meaningful um, to kids who think and learn in that different way. I think that's such a great point that you brought up because I, I honestly feel like, you know, when you work with one kid with autism, you've worked with one kid with autism. There are so many differences and so many different ways that they learn and they play and they interact with their environment and difficulties that they face as well. And so I like that rather than I feel like a lot of times people just try to pinpoint and really narrow in. You are saying, no, let's look at the the broader picture. Let's look at the wider scope here to really gain that deeper understanding of what's going on with these kiddos and how we as occupational therapists can help them. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's such an interesting balance because what you say is so true that each person with autism is so different. And most of the time, the kids who I've worked with are more like their parents than each other. You know, they come with their own personalities and interests and strengths and um, developmental levels and intellectual abilities. But there are certain things that all of our kids with autism are going to have in common, which is why and how they appropriately got the diagnosis of autism, right? And so when we understand what those commonalities are, then we can start there and say, oh, let's look at how social differences or routines or restricted interest or whatever it is impacts this child's learning. And then go from there to say, what does that look like with this child as an individual, Yes, that is amazing. That's perfect what you said right there. Like it's a starting point. We understand where they are. We understand kind of what the diagnosis looks like and how it typically will present. But then it's like, all right, 
that's our starting point. Now what? What are they interested in? What does the family want them to be able to do? What do they themselves want to be able to do? And then tie in that really kind of occupation-based focus to get them to be able to reach those goals and really kind of progress and challenge themselves. I totally agree. And I think when we have um, kind of a limited set of interventions, uh, we try to apply it to all of our kids with autism and it just doesn't work. I was teaching this past week a course on teaching communication exchange, like picture exchange and object exchange. And I was talking to a therapist who said, yeah, in my company, we use PEX, the picture exchange communication system with everybody, which is like a giant binder of very symbolic pictures. And she was like, I think I've seen maybe one kid in my whole practice who actually understands symbolic pictures. She was like, so this is a good intervention, but I wish my colleagues had a deeper understanding of how to individualize for what a particular kid really understands. And I think the limiting factor there sometimes is we can't do that because we don't know what else to do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. it's, it's cliche, but if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. And OT is such a broad field that it's so easy to fall into that. Like I've got these five strategies, so I'm going to use them pretty much for all of my kids when sometimes they're um, not the right tool for how that particular child understands the world. Exactly. And and I think this just showcases what you were saying about taking that step back and looking at it more broadly, not just saying, hey, this is what I know, this is what I'm going to do. It's like, no, let's take a step back. Let's evaluate and reevaluate the situation so we can really make sure that we are addressing and we are getting to the root of, of what this child really needs to be doing and wants to be doing. Yeah. And I think what you said about evaluating and reevaluating is really important because, you know, we only see so much in our eval or in our first assessment. And then, you know, when we kind of put on our detective hat, we can try something and see how it goes and be like, oh, man, that didn't work. What good information? Let me try something different Um, as opposed to trying something and being like, this is all I've got, or I spent a lot of time putting this together. So this is what I'm doing (laughs) that we are value. We are constantly assessing and reassessing and reassessing and learning from our kids about what's meaningful for them. Yeah. And like, that was one of the best pieces of advice that I got from one of my mentors, like really early on was when you get stuck, take a step back. Don't just keep hammering away, right? Like take a step back and just watch and see what's happening and then move forward because you'll get a much clearer view when you take a moment to just reflect on what's happening and try to see the bigger picture and not just focus on specifically what it was that maybe you were looking at before or what you've been trained in and all this kind of stuff. So I'm curious, you know a lot about autism. How how did you get into specializing with autism and what was it about this population that that drew you to it? You know, it's kind of funny. When I was in graduate school, there was a a scholarship opportunity that I did not apply for, for people who knew they wanted to work with kids with autism. And I did not know if I wanted to work with kids with autism. And so I did not apply for that scholarship, which I, I had some very talented classmates, so I'm sure I wouldn't have gotten it. But in retrospect, I'm like kicking myself <laughs> as I pay my student loans, you know. Yep. <laughs> um, so I didn't know in graduate school. And then in field work, um, I had a CI with a lot of talent and, and great skills, but her approach was very behavioral and it wasn't a good fit for my personality. And she always told me I needed to be firmer and kind of meaner and less fun. And, you know, I remember thinking, I just can't work with kids with autism. I'm not good at this. So it wasn't until I was in early intervention and I was in the schools and, you know, I found that most of my caseload was kids with autism that I started really learning about other approaches that were effective and and really felt right to me that I actually started enjoying my work because my kids were able to make sense of me because I was teaching or beginning to teach in a way that made sense to them. And I was starting to enjoy it because it felt like a good fit for who I am and how I like to relate to people. 
But even then, it wasn't until I started working for UNC Chapel Hill's Teach Autism program that I was like, oh, man, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you learn it. And everything I learned, I was thinking, I wish I had known this for the last like three years in schools and early intervention. And so in that position, which I'm no longer there because I decided to go into private practice after I had children. But um, in that position, I was just constantly, constantly taught and trained and mentored. And it was so incredible because I was taught and trained and mentored by some of the best minds in autism that are out there in a way that like sat right with me and clicked and felt good and made sense and was effective. Um, So it was through that process that I really started to feel like I had deep and meaningful understanding of what I was doing finally. I I think that's a really kind of common thing for new grads or maybe somebody that switched from working with adults to working in pediatrics. And especially when they're faced with working with a kid with autism, you can kind of feel like a fish out of water and like, I don't know how to get through to this kid. They don't even want to look at me. They don't want to look at any of the toys. Like, what am I supposed to do? And it almost sounds like you saw this challenge and originally you were like, this is not a good fit. But then somewhere along the line, you were like, wait a second, maybe it's it's not that it's not a good fit. It's just a challenge. And I need to dig a little bit deeper to really see how I can help these kids. Yes. But you know, it was messy. <laughs> And, and it wasn't pretty. Um, you know, my, my friends who were close to me at the time that I was starting out an early intervention could tell you that I was, um, it, it's such an uncomfortable place to be feeling like you have this important job to do. I think especially in early intervention where you're faced with families who are counting on you to help them. They need help. They want help. You are the person sitting there in front of them and you have no idea yeah, most of the time as a new graduate, what you're doing. So that's a lot of pressure and really, really stressful. So I think that in retrospect, I'm really glad for having had that experience because the majority of what I do now um, is consulting and teaching and training. And I just have so much compassion and um, I relate so much to the experience of people who are new or not so new and feeling kind of like they are faking it or floundering or sort of halfway doing something, but they don't know how to get to where they want to be. Because I mean, I was spending like 20 hours a week on research databases, which did not help me (laughs) learn new (laughs) clinical skills. It just made me more tired and more stressed and eventually drove me out of early intervention for a little while. Well, and I'm sure that was on top of everything else that you had going on. So I'm not sure where you found those extra 20 hours to do that, but for it to not be helpful or beneficial, it's like, (laughs) oh man. (laughs) Yeah, it was pretty bad. You know, um, I was like driving all over the state. I had a really high cancellation rate. Um, I think early intervention is an amazing setting. But I think that there are some some logistical challenges. And if you have clinical challenges with your skills, um, you haven't learned how to coach parents, you don't have a toolbox full of interventions on top of trying to figure out the logistical challenges of traveling and cancellations. And you're probably an independent contractor. And are you going to get paid? It's too much. It was too much for me. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. I mean, I, I work in the field, so I completely understand everything that you're saying. And yeah, I feel like if like thinking back, if I was struggling clinically, along with all these other things, challenges, boundaries, barriers that you face being like working in in home-based therapy. It's a lot. It's really challenging. And especially you don't really have the like you're not working in a clinic. So you don't have a mentor that's like right there or a supervisor or you're not watching other therapists do their sessions. And so you really have to kind of take it on yourself in order to figure out how and what and 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 really what to do. So I wanted to know what What are some of the most common questions that you get from other therapists in regards to autism and play? 
So one of the first things that, um, well, I'm going to sort of answer your question. <laughs> That's um, okay. Roll I think <laughs> the question that I, that therapists should be asking that they don't know they should be asking is how do I write a good play goal for my kids with autism? Because a lot of the times therapists are struggling with their play intervention because they haven't picked the right goal and they don't know that because they don't have a clear um, sense of play skills, social play skills, and sort of, even though the play, the development of play skills isn't fully sequential, we have to at least have some sort of hierarchy in our head so that we know that we're landing in the right place to, so that we can teach our kids the right goal that they're going to be successful at learning. And so often therapists are landing on the goal that they know how to teach <laughs> rather than the goal that their client is ready to learn. Ooh, I like that. That, who I'm like, I'm, I'm letting that sin- sink in for a second. <laughs> that's really good. And I think that's just, that's so important for therapists to start to understand. It's not just going off of, what we know to teach, right? Like it's what, it's how we want to get them to be able to learn the skill, maybe in between, or maybe a little building block to get to where we want them to ultimately be. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think an example of that, that I see a lot is therapists who want to work on social play skills, which are sort of the social interaction skills that are necessary to play together with other people. I see a lot of therapists who um, work on turn taking sort of by default. Um, I think sometimes without even thinking about it, they're like, my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn. And often they're doing that with a child who hasn't yet learned to even share their materials or who hasn't even learned to do the activity that they're trying to teach without turn taking. And it's too much trying to teach a child who can't share their materials how to take turns is too big of a jump. You're not going to be successful. You're going to be kind of controlling the process the whole time and never, you're never going to get to fade out your prompts and to help that child be independent in that skill. It's just going to be this, this thing that you do, my turn, your turn for no real reason. That's not really meaningful for the child. And then if you're trying to teach a new activity at the same time, you're sort of losing out on an opportunity to focus on teaching that new play activity because you're doing this my turn, your turn thing. So I think that, again, the, the challenge there is that therapists aren't super duper clear on what they're trying to teach and what the little micro steps are. So I might say, OK, if you want to teach social play, can the child imitate Can the child share the materials? Can they trade materials? Can they trade if the materials are very similar, if they're very different? Can they take turns? Can they play games with rules? And if they can't do all of those things underneath, whatever it is that you like working on, it's probably not time to work on that big skill. It's time to work on those foundational skills. Yeah, it's almost like I feel like when a therapist is setting up the activity, they almost combine the social the, the social part of it and the actual like physical part of the activity in one. And don't realize that if you want to teach a new skill, fine motor, gross motor, whatever it is, focus on that. And if you want to work on social, focus on that and make sure that they have mastered one before you start to combine them. Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest points. And I think it's something that we like have always patted ourselves on the back for like, I'm working on fine motor and play and sensory processing all in this one activity, which sometimes is awesome, right? But sometimes it's too much and it's going to make you really ineffective at all of it. I like to use analogies so that we can kind of relate to that experience. Like if you were learning something new, like, I don't know, something really hard. Like, let's say you're not very good at math and you're learning some higher level math skill and you're also not very good at speaking Spanish. And so they're like, you know what? This is cool. I'm just going to hit all of this at once and teach you calculus in Spanish. You'd be like, (laughs) you'd be completely shut down, right? You're not learning Spanish and you're not learning calculus. 
Um, because when we're teaching one new skill, the other skills really should be mastered. And in this sense, we need to be able to separate in our heads what is a play skill, functional toy use, cause and effect toys, sensory exploration, pretend play, acting out pretend scenarios. What is the play skill versus what is the social play? And I just talked about some of the social play abilities, the turn taking and all that. And if I am teaching a child for the first time to do a new play skill, I'm going to make sure that I'm not also teaching them a new social play skill and vice versa. So if my kid is learning imitation and I'm trying to teach them how to imitate during play, I'm not also going to teach them a new game. I'm going to do like a really simple put in activity or driving cars on the road or something that is already familiar and interesting and mastered so that I'm not losing them by trying to teach two things at once. Yeah, that that is it right there. Like teaching teaching two things or teaching too many things at once and really trying to focus on what it is that you want them to do, what 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 goal it is that you want them to accomplish and just focusing on that. And I totally agree when you are saying so, so many times we just we as therapists just try to throw everything together, gross motor, fine motor, bilateral and social and this and that. And it's like, look at this fantastic activity. But then I also think so many times that's when we find ourselves like hitting our heads against the wall of like, I can't get them to do what it is that I want them to do. Why is this not working? I have this beautiful multi-step, multifaceted activity and they won't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, my activities are usually not very beautiful for so many reasons. Um, like the secret real reason is that I'm just not crafty and I, I just find it impractical to spend tons of time putting an activity together <laughs> because then the parent or the teacher or whoever is not going to be able to replicate it because they don't have an hour to put a beautiful activity together. But also because when we do that, it's so much harder to do what we were talking about at the beginning and change it when our kids are like, you know what, this isn't working for me. When they show us by, you know, going under the table and leaving or by tearing up your visuals that what you've created isn't meaningful. If you're like, but it's so awesome and I work so hard on it, then you're really not going to want to go back to the drawing board. So my play interventions are pretty simple and either use stuff that parents would have lying around their house or stuff that they could throw together quickly and cheaply and without ever going to Pinterest. That that has been one of the biggest and most successful interventions that I've ever, that, that I do, I should say, that I ever do. Uh, you mentioned this on your blog about just keeping play simple. And that's amazing. And I honestly think that's like, that's what we need to get back to and keeping it simple, keeping it engaged and making it where the parents can carry it over, the grandparents can carry it over, the the nanny, the whoever is, uh, the siblings, whoever is taking care of the child at that moment, they can do this as well as well. And it's so important to just keep it simple. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking about when you said that you are not crafty I I would I would like to think that I'm a little bit crafty. My mom is like super crafty, my sister's crafty. And so I think I have a little bit of that. My big thing is that I don't have the time. I don't have time to spend an hour to put into building this amazing activity and building this this thing for the, for a child. And so a lot of times I'm grabbing what I have and I'm rolling with it and they turn into be the best treatments and the best activities for those kids. And so I think it's fantastic that you're so big and so passionate about just keeping it simple and making it easy for you, but then also easy for the parent or easy easy for anybody else. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I have like one kid and <laughs> I can't Imagine if somebody came into my house and showed me something that obviously took a long time to make. I think I would laugh them out the door. Like, I'm not even that busy. My life isn't that chaotic. <laughs> and there's no way I could fit something else in, you know? Yeah. Like, just getting him and myself to bed at night is is good enough. <laughs> That's a win. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's 
I also taught high school for a year. And so when I think about our school-based people, if somebody came into my classroom and was like, you just need to do this complicated thing every day and make make it mm-hmm. with visuals and laminate it and fuck it, I'd be like, get out or I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that being said, I think when we were talking about the feeling of, oh, my God, I'm new to early intervention and I don't know what I'm doing, I think, honestly, it takes a long time for theory to impact practice. The the, the figure that I've heard in social change theory is 17 years. Ooh. So most of <laughs> us who have graduated in the last 10 were taught that we should be going into homes, teaching parents interventions, using stuff that's in the house rather than bringing in a bag of toys. But then what we saw on our field works was not that. I mean, I never saw that. I saw a therapist bringing in a bag of fun stuff and (laughs) using it and then leaving. And so then, like you said, you're in this new setting where you don't have colleagues that you're watching and you've literally never had it modeled for you how to practice the way you would like to practice. Um, Hopefully that's not everyone's experience, but that was mine. And I felt like I was just supposed to to do it out of thin air because I knew that's what I was supposed to do. (laughs) And that's, that's impossible. Completely. Yeah. Like that resonates with me because that's that's exactly what I saw as well. I think it's just really important to, again, going back, making it simple and utilizing what the clients have in their natural environment. I, I'm, I'm going to go out and say I think sometimes when we as therapists bring bags of toys in, it's almost a crutch. It's almost cheating because we know what we have and we know what we can do with it and we have a plan. And when you show up and you don't bring anything in there, you really don't know what you're going to have available. Like you might have been to the house before and know kind of what toys they have, but they might not be there today. They might have been broken or maybe they're in another room. And so you just kind of walk in, you're like, all right, I'm going to make my plan right now and we're going to see what we have and we're going to roll with it. And it's just, it's so pivotal, I think, to help the parents understand how to play with any object because literally anything you can turn into a fun game or in an an engaging game with with a child just yesterday i was sitting with a client and they had gotten this new toy probably just like a couple weeks ago and i like pulled it out and started showing the dad a couple things of like, oh, you can do this and you can do that. And they were like little stacking cups and all these things you could do with it. And the dad just kind of sat there and was like, oh, wow, I didn't realize this is what you could do with this toy. Oh. I didn't realize you could do, you could stack them or you could hide things inside or you could do all these different things. And all of a sudden, like the light bulbs just started going off in his head of like, oh, you don't just put them together and make a ball. I'm like, no, you could do whatever you want with these. And I think that's really what we need to be focusing on and, and, and empowering the parents of it doesn't matter what it is, you can come up with something creative and, and play with it. I think that's so powerful. I will say I have one caveat to my personal not bringing things in policy. <laughs> I actually have a couple. I kind of have a balanced approach to this. Because I do think that because of how our kids with autism learn, receptive language is often not a strength. So the way that we are used to teaching kids by just telling them what to do, giving lots of instructions often doesn't work. And a lot of our kids don't have imitation. Mm -hmm. Um, So sometimes showing them what to do with a toy doesn't work. So we sometimes do need to know how to use structure and visual instructions within our play activities. And um, so sometimes I'll bring like pieces of cardboard that I can use to like stabilize materials down. If a kid is getting distracted and knocking them off the table, and if we could eliminate that by just stabilizing them onto a tray or a piece of cardboard or something, or I'll bring some brightly colored tape so that I can make the instructions that are within the materials more obvious, like outlining the shapes on the shape sorter or whatever it is. And then I do also, beyond bringing materials to create structure and to create visual instructions, I sometimes bring a few new and different things just to see what the kid will do. 
And often I'll come back the next week and the parent has recreated or bought those activities because they're like, I didn't know he was ready for that. I didn't know how to teach him how to do that. And I'm so excited that I got to see him doing that because now like I'm all in. But it is not expensive, fancy stuff. It's still accessible stuff. And that's not bagless. <laughs> that's, yeah. <laughs> as I said, it's really balanced because I do, I bring those things in both for assessment because um, I really need to see the child attempt to play at every level on my play skills hierarchy. And if the parents don't have those toys, I'm not going to get a clear picture of what they can do. And the parents probably don't know what they can do. And then I bring it in for teaching. I'll bring in one or two things to try. And then I'll talk to the parent about what they saw, how or if they could incorporate what they saw. I don't ever tell them to buy things. But often parents who are already looking for new ideas are really excited to have seen one or two new things. So that's sort of my balanced approach that I've found works really, really well. Okay, so you totally read my mind with that because I definitely still bring things in as well. (laughs) I try to limit it as much as possible, but the word you said was balance. Like bringing in some things to evaluate and teach and see what they can do, especially if it's something that you can't get in the home or that you can't make really easily or even ask the parent to make before you show up the next time. Yeah, it's like, I, I love that you said bring in things that are easy to be made and and they're simple. And so, so many times I'll bring in like a little shapes order or something that I've cut out, like I cut out of a a container of some sort or of all these like very simple toys that I've made, you know, and they've taken five to 10 minutes maybe to, to create. And then I show up the next week and the parent has made their own based on what they had in the house. And I'm like, I love this. Like, this is what should be happening. And it's amazing when that when you see and it's like they didn't do exactly how you did it, but they they used what they had and they used what was meaningful, meaningful for the child. And it was perfect. And so I think really having that balance, I keep going back to that word, having the balance of bringing things in to help facilitate what's going on with the child and your clinical reasoning and help you understand where that child is and where they need to still get to, but then also allowing it to naturally happen within the home as well and not forcing the parents to go buy things, but inspiring them of, hey, here's just a simple idea. This is something that I did. You can easily do it yourself. I think it's a little harder in the clinic So if you're working in a clinic, you have to use the things that you have there pretty much. I do encourage families when I have worked in a clinic in the past to bring in things from home that um, they feel like the child could potentially be successful at or they would really like the child to be successful at, but they're not playing with well yet or things that they are playing with, but the parent would like the child to use more flexibly. And we'll incorporate those into our sessions. But I think it's tricky because I always struggled in the clinic with the balance between having nice things <laughs> and having homemade things. You know, there's It feels a little different to pull out your, your, your janky like box that you've cut holes into. Um, that like there's duct tape just like trying to hold it together. <laughs> there's always duct tape. Yes. <laughs> And, you know, that might inspire the parent, oh, hey, I can do this. But your clinic director might be like, what is all of this <laughs> junk? Like some families are paying a lot of money per hour and you're pulling out all these cardboard boxes. So I just want to acknowledge that that is a different kind of struggle in the clinic. Um, so if I am working in a clinic where I have to use nice things, I always talk to the parent about how they can translate what we're doing to what they have at home. And in my practice, in in every setting I've worked in, I am not the interventionist the parent is. I am their coach. So the parent is learning these new skills, and then I'm helping them figure out how to translate it to the materials that they have at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you brought up a little earlier, you brought up the term imitate. And I kind of want to get back to this because I feel like a lot of times when we're trying to teach play, we are trying to teach through imitation. And I'm sure somebody's listening to this going, well, I have a lot of kids and they won't even imitate me. 
what like what are some strategies or, or what advice do you give to these therapists out there that have these kids that aren't doing any sort of imitation, very little engagement and very little interaction with people or toys? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And that was definitely my my first challenge on my first day in early intervention. It's like, oh man, <laughs> what do you do when a kid doesn't imitate? And I, my answer is twofold. Like one, we've sort of always already talked about that we need to have a very robust set of tools at every level, including for kids who don't understand pictures about how to use structure and how to embed visual instructions in their learning activities. But the other avenue that we need to know how to take is how to teach imitation without prompting. (laughs) So our kids with autism learn routines quickly. And once they form those routines, they can be hard to change. So if we are, if we are getting a kid's attention and saying, do this, every time we want them to imitate, then what they're learning is when someone says, do this, I should do what they're doing. And that's not how kids play together. If you watch typically developing very young children doing quote unquote parallel play, and I put it in quotes because parallel lines never intersect. And those two (laughs) two two-year-olds that you're watching are just intersecting all over the place, right? (laughs) They're watching each other. They're becoming inspired. Um, One of the kids at my two-year-old's little preschool likes to stand against the door and bang his back on the door. And my kid thinks that's awesome. And he wants to do it too. (laughs) So they both stand together and just bang their backs on the door because they're two. But nobody said, hey, watch what he's doing and go do it. Mm -hmm. And we want our kids with autism to learn to watch and be interested in what others are doing and to imitate them without prompting. So um, the set of tools that we can use to do that, I call them naturalistic strategies that's the other end of the spectrum from behavioral strategies. Some of the more familiar approaches um, to OTs are like floor time or um, some parts of the early start Denver model, I think DIR. Um, My training is from people who were trained in early start Denver model approach, which is um, a wonderful approach that sort of blends the best of behavioral and the best of naturalistic strategies. And so that's where you're kind of entering the child's world. You're getting face to face with them. You're imitating them. And kids, even my most concrete, socially unengaged kids with autism, eventually think it's pretty cool that I'm doing what they're (laughs) doing or that mom's doing what they're doing. And eventually most of them will look at you like, whoa. (laughs) doing what I'm doing. That's awesome. And that's your moment that you can try something different without prompting. And eventually, most of your kids with autism will imitate you spontaneously in that moment. And it's this really nice dance where you're going back and forth between who's leading the play. And that is very, very different than a therapist directed activity. Do this, try this, make it fly. Um, all of the ways that we kind of naturally want to teach a kid by just being very didactic. That being said, without training, this way of playing is completely unnatural. It is different from how we play with typically developing kids. We don't have to play with typically developing kids using these strategies. It doesn't matter. You can play with, you can make commands and ask questions and it goes fine. So it really takes some practice and some work to develop this new set of skills and this new routine. It's it's really unnatural at first, but once you get good at it, it's very, very exciting and opens a lot of doors. Yeah. And, and I think too, especially like if it's a kiddo that won't even look at you or you feel like it's not even visually attending to what you're doing, just start playing. Play by yourself, play with the parent, play if you have a student with you, just start playing and showing them how to engage with these toys that you're either bringing in or that they have, and then not expect anything from them. And then if you can, like, start imitating them, right? Like, if they're doing something, like, you show, like, hey, I'm watching you. I'm not telling you that I'm watching you, but I am. And then all of a sudden, it, like, starts to almost strike up this 
curiosity in them of like, wait a second, they're not paying attention to me. What are they doing over there? I'm starting to get interested. But I think one of the things that happens is that that initial um, connection is so brief right in the beginning. It is a second or it is two seconds where the kid kind of looks and then turns away and goes back to whatever it was that they were doing. And I think so often that initial curiosity and that initial wanting to join in is what is 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 missed by the therapist Mm -hmm. and then they get frustrated that what they're doing isn't working and i i think it's just so important to highlight that this could take a long time to to really initially get that first line of imitation or that first line of even the, the the thought within their brain to start imitating and to to not get frustrated to just keep going and just keep showing them but then also being in tune to what they're doing and trying to bring them in without telling them or asking them to do it I I totally agree with what you're saying about that that brief moment and having to be able to see it and know that that was progress my own mentor used to say to me, your problem is you think you can get your kids to meet their goals. <laughs> She's like, you can't get your kids to meet their goals. I mean, you could try. She was, she was amazing. She wasn't, this was not an OT. She was a special educator. She was like, I just noticed this with therapists. You think you can teach a kid anything, but at the end of the day, they're still going to be them. They're still going to have their learning style and, and you need to stop feeling so powerful. <laughs> and like, <laughs> Take small steps and notice the little gains and celebrate those and accept that maybe um, most of the hour is not going to be full of them following your directions and social engagement and work work from where you're at. And it was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot. It's, it's a process to get there, especially when, you know, we're describing we have this strategy and we try it and we see a glimmer of it working and then it works more and more. Um, But sometimes even with these naturalistic strategies, I've had to really be able to scaffold down and down and down um, for kids who are very, very rigid and who really are not ready to share their materials. (laughs) So I can't go grab a train and imitate the kid Mm -hmm. because that is a 30 (laughs) minute meltdown because that's not how you cannot grab my train. And I respect that. Like, whoops, <laughs> I, I've learned that I should not grab your train. So I've come in with a cardboard cutout of a train or with a blue block that I pretend is a train or I stand across the room and just describe what the child is doing. Um, but we have to be able to switch gears so quickly when, surprise, we just devastated a kid and created a major meltdown by trying to use these strategies that we thought would work. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The the other thing that I was thinking too was when you go in and you are just imitating the child or you're just playing, but the child is not engaged, right? In that very beginning stages. And then all of a sudden you get the parent that's like, what are you doing? You're not doing anything, right? Like they haven't bought into the therapy yet. They don't understand that what you're doing now is a building block to get where they are like the goals that they have for their child. So you're frustrated because you're sitting there and you're like, I got a second of attention and that's it. And I have to build on this. And then you have the added pressure from the parent that's like, yeah, this this therapist doesn't know what she's doing. How do you combat that? Because you know how important it is, but you don't quite have that buy-in or the understanding from the parent yet because they want the kid to go from point A to point B without going through everything else in between. It's just one to the other. That is a great question. And yes, that can feel so stressful. Um, I'm going to circle back to the first question you asked me <laughs> that I didn't actually answer. You said, <laughs> what is one the one thing that therapists are always asking you about kids with autism? And I was like, let me tell you what they should be asking. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the question that they actually ask is, how do I structure my sessions? Hmm. 
Um, when I, I do some one-on-one -on -one consultation and people who have taken, I teach a full course on autism interventions and people who have taken my course are like, awesome. I've got all these tools in my toolbox. I can't wait to use them, but wait, how do I structure my sessions? And I think that that question is really important for addressing what you are describing right there. Um, and I'll tell you how I structure my sessions, both in the clinic and in the home. Um, it is a mix of consultation and coaching, which are different. So consultation is where I'm the expert, I know some things, and I want to tell you those things. And so at the beginning of my session, I will have a brief consultative didactic part of the session with the parent and this is after the like check-in what did you try how did it go all of that stuff um, but then I'm saying okay what I want to talk about today is teaching imitation here are some reasons why imitation is hard for kids with autism and I make sure to tailor it so that it I'm speaking to how the parent understands. I'm not being very technical um, unless they're one of those very technical parents that I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll meet them there. You know, here's why it's hard. Um, here's one of the things that we can do to help. And here's why we do it this way. So I will explain to them what they're about to see and why. And then I switch gears to coaching. And I ask permission, is it okay if I show you a different way to play with your kid? And they always say yes, because they're like, you're the therapist. Aren't you supposed to be doing <laughs> stuff? And I'm like, actually, you're the parent. You're in charge. So I then, in this instance, if we're practicing naturalistic strategies, I will tell them one thing to watch for. Watch how I narrate what he's doing instead of asking him questions or telling him what to do. Because our parents and our fieldwork students are not skilled observers because they don't know what to look for. They don't know what they're seeing. Um, and I don't know if you remember like shadowing before OT school. You're just watching. You don't, <laughs> you don't really have a clue. And our parents never signed up to be therapists. Right. They, they, don't, they might not only not have a clue, they might not really be that interested um, or that adept at this sort of thing. Or they and might so just I, have more, like so much else going on on their plate that they yeah. don't even have the mental capacity to focus on something like play with their child. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. Yes. So if we want any hope of them learning the strategy we're trying to teach and understanding it, I tell them one thing to watch for. Watch how I X, Y, Z, and then I do it. And then I ask an open-ended question. Hey, what'd you notice? And um, that's hard because you want to be like, that was so awesome. I did the thing and then he imitated me and he did the thing. Did you see that? It was super cool because you've noticed that. Um but really, you've missed an opportunity to learn about what the parents saw. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll say, oh, I saw him doing that stemming thing I want him to stop doing. Or um, they'll notice something that helps you understand more deeply what their priorities are and where they're at. And then I like professor pivot on them where I'm like, yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> I observed this. I wonder if it was because of this. Um, and then I have the parents try it and, you know, they kind of, when they're actually doing the intervention, it doesn't seem so, Hey, I don't think you're actually doing anything. Then it, uh, frankly, I think it often seems intimidating. So, you know, we have to be really careful to set our parents up for success, um, and our teachers when we're consulting with teachers and to give positive feedback to shape their behavior rather than telling them what they did wrong. Um, but you know, you remember being on field work and your supervisor being like, you try it. And you're like, Oh my God, <laughs> this is too much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our teach, our parents feel that too, and they don't even have training usually. So, um, so I have them try it and then we reflect again. Um, and I have never found setting up my session like this, that the parents like, you're not really doing anything because we're on the same page the whole time or we're working our way there. And I'm very, very slowly and very specifically building up their understanding of what the intervention is, why it's happening and how they can use it in their daily lives. 
one of my favorite things just to like totally piggyback on with what you just said there is when you have more than one caregiver present because it's not just you and say mom or you and dad you have mom and dad or maybe mom and grandma or mom and an older sibling and then all of a sudden you can ask hey mom what did you see and then hey dad what did you see and almost you get like two more brains or three more brains or whatever it is and everyone's going to pick up on something slightly different and then when you ask them to do it you can say okay dad now it's your turn you're going to go do whatever it was that we just did and mom you're going to watch and then at the after that ask mom what did you see what like how do you think dad did what what's going on and when i have multiple caregivers present it is amazing how much they start to identify when somebody else is doing something that maybe isn't wrong, but like could be tweaked a little bit and could be facilitated in a, in a different way. And then all of a sudden that carryover when you're not there just starts to happen naturally. And it's like, it's absolutely amazing. And it's been one of those like, so like such beneficial things that I've seen, uh, especially like working in the home environment and especially with those really challenging kids is that the multiple caregivers will kind of keep each other in check. Yeah, they do. And those those dynamics can be complicated too when yeah. one one parent is like the interventionist and they're trying to get the other parent on board. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, it's so much easier to take direction from somebody who's not your partner. <laughs> so I think it's really nice for that parent to get to step back and watch the therapist teach dad or mom or whoever how to do this new skill. And, and they, they are not the ones coaching. They are not the ones teaching. But I agree with you when that parent who usually has a more backseat role or who has less confidence around these things takes the driver's seat. I think it's also a really nice opportunity to um, give them really positive feedback about what they've done well in yes. front of that other parent yes. so that you're building <laughs> confidence and to let them reflect even before the observing parent so that they're they're building up that skill set and that confidence when they're usually overshadowed by you know special education teacher super duper fun wife or husband or whoever <laughs> Yeah. Oh, uh, man, this this has been like amazing. So much good stuff. So many actionable tips. So many things that I'm sure people are going to go, oh, aha, I get it. Right. And I want to take a minute. I want to pivot a little bit. And I want to let you share a little bit about what you are up to right now. I know you have so much on your plate. You have uh, everything with Learn, Play, and Thrive with the blog and the website. You have a Facebook group, an ebook, and a course that's just come out too. And so I'd love for you to just take a minute and share what this is all about. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like I mentioned before, my favorite thing to do is to teach and train therapists. So they can walk into their session tomorrow with a kid with autism and be like, I got this, <laughs> you know, I know what I'm going to try. And if or when it doesn't go well, I know how to take that information and change it. I really like to watch therapists go through that process of filling their tool bag with relevant and effective tools and learning how to use them so that they can feel inspired and look forward to their work rather than feeling like uh, anxious or stressed or bored in what they're doing. So I do teach some online classes. My main course is called the Learn, Play, Thrive Approach to Autism. And um, it is not always open for enrollment. I take students in groups, but it's open the whole month of April. I um, open it four times a year. So I am enrolling a limited number of students for the month of April. And in that course, I teach an in-depth lesson on how kids with autism think and learn based on the latest research. And that's the foundation for everything else that happens. I teach my behavior problem solving process, how we can generate a very robust list of hypotheses and interventions based on that deep knowledge of autism learning styles. 
I even give a little workbook and a fillable PDF that folks can use that I use all the time, even though I've been doing it for forever. I teach how to use structure, how to use visual instructions, how to figure out what types of those things you need, which is sometimes objects, not pictures. We work really in depth on making schedules that our kids can use and that'll help them be more flexible rather than more rigid. I have a long two hour lesson with tons of videos on play and social play. And then we put it all together for community integration. So it's very practical, practice driven class where you're gonna learn how to do an assessment, how to develop an intervention, how to teach it, and how to help your kid generalize it. So what therapists tell me afterwards is that they're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to try this stuff right now. I've been to those classes that you think are gonna be awesome, and then it's a lot of theory. <laughs> and you're <laughs> like, no, I didn't learn anything I could use. So it's it's a very practical class. I also have a few like smaller mini classes on communication, and I teach a couple of the modules from my full course as standalone courses for people who don't need the whole package. But for folks who do want to enroll in the Learn, Play, Thrive approach to autism, I um, created a coupon code just for just for your tribe, your OT for Life listeners. And it's just OT, the number four, L-Y-F-E, and the number 25 for $25 off for your people for making it this far in our conversation. <laughs> awesome. I am so excited, so pumped about that. Thank you so much. And I, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't say enough if anybody out there is looking to become more skilled in, in working with kids with autism, or if you're switching from adults to pediatrics, or if you're a new grad, you know, go check out what Meg has to offer because there is so much out there and so much useful information and exactly what you said, like, actionable that you can you can take with you and start implementing today if you want to and so definitely go check out everything that she has and I have I have another I have one more question actually I have two more questions for you I like okay uh so uh my one question is if you have one word to describe occupational therapy what would it be (laughs) <laughs> um, so the first word that came to my head was actually broad, <laughs> like, it is such a broad field, um, with so much potential and so much possibility that, um, is awesome for those of us who can figure out what we want to do and be like, yeah, that's totally within my scope. That's an occupation, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But I think it's also why we can feel so stuck because it's not like we learned how to do one thing in school, you know, because they can't teach you everything in school (laughs) because it is such a broad, broad field. So that was that was the like top of my head response for you. Yeah. You know what? And I I like that because it is it, it is so broad. And that's one of the reasons I like asking this question because everybody comes up with something slightly different and it is a broad field and this just highlights that there is so much encompassing and so much going on with it. And um, also, I wanted to give you the opportunity if people wanted to learn more about your course, find you on the internet, social media, all that good stuff, where can they find you? Yeah, so I am online at learnplaythrive.com. And from there, folks can find out about all of my courses. You can link to my Facebook group. Um, If you want to search for the Facebook group directly, it's called Learn, Play, and Thrive Autism Resources for Professionals. We have almost 2,000 people now, and I do lots of like little Facebook live videos where I'll teach one specific skill and we have lots of awesome and interesting discussions. Uh, I have some stuff on YouTube, but honestly, I have a lot more on Facebook and on my website. Um, I also have two free eBooks, which you mentioned, and you can get those on learnplaythrive.com as well. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Well, we can kind of, we'll wrap this up. Is there anything that you wanted to mention before we kind of close out? No, it's been so great talking to you today. I feel like 
I learned some things and I really enjoyed our conversation. Hey, before you go, I just wanted to say thanks for listening to today's episode. If you want to further the discussion, go to our website, otforlife.com, and join our Facebook group. If you like us, here are three easy ways to let us know. One, share our podcast with a friend, colleague, or anyone interested in occupational therapy. Two, leave us a review on iTunes or anywhere this podcast is found. Three, subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Thanks again. We'll catch you next time, OT for Lifers. You took it there already. And I was like, yeah. Right. Oh, now, oh, now you're just talking to me. Okay. Sorry. I was still being podcasting. Oh. I was like, so yeah, yeah, no, that was perfect. I felt like we were reading each other's minds a little bit. Yeah. Right. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. This was so much fun. And I feel like we did a really good job keeping it under that like hour and 15 minutes. We're on the cusp, but we're right there. Yeah. No screaming toddler <laughs> in the background.